Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Metabolism and Menopause podcast. My name is Stephanie, and I am your host and CEO of Vitality OET. We are a women's nutrition, health, and fitness company that focuses predominantly on women's hormones, particularly as they start going through perimenopause and onwards. We know that so many things change in this time of your life, whether it be hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, brain fog, bloating, or waking that has come on across the middle despite you not changing anything. So you go back to your tried and true methods of cutting calories, cutting carbs, joining whatever weight loss program you've done in the past, doing a bunch of cardio, yet it seems like nothing is working. You're putting in a ton of effort and not getting any results, or you start seeing the scale go in the opposite direction than what you want. But we know now that your body is inherently different than what it was prior to you starting to experience these hormonal changes. So our mission here at Vitality is to help you really understand what happens to your body in this time of your life so that you can reach your health and fitness goals, live a life full of vitality, really feel in control and at home in your body again, and understand how to take care of this new body of yours. So today, what I want to talk about is a little less sciencey physio- physiology type stuff. Um, there'll be a little bit of that in here because I love that stuff. But today I want to talk about body image. Um, I went to a conference not that long ago in Dallas where I got to meet uh, Molly Galbraith. Love her. Wonderful human being. And she talked a lot about body image um, and it was very powerful. She shared some very um, kind of scary statistics, to be honest. And the information um, that I'm going to talk about today, some of it has been like inspiration from there, but there's a lot of information in here that we work specifically with perimenopausal and menopausal women. So first of all, body image is one of the most popular topics among our clients and in the fitness space in general. In today's world, it is almost impossible not to be consumed by thoughts about our body right? We are constantly bombarded with images that portray bodies in certain ways or make it seem like these body types are quote unquote the ideal standard, right? And you know the type that we're talking about. We're talking about women with the toned abs and the small waist and the big butt and the rounded shoulders and they look so sculpted. And these images are not only harmful for our mental health and our self-esteem, but they also really warp our perception as to what is realistically achievable because I am never going to look like certain people because my torso is very small. Um, So for me, I have to get a lot leaner because I do have a short torso in order to see changes like a visible six pack. That's happened to me once and that will probably never happen again. And I'm actually okay with that because When I was in that state, I was very unhealthy. So for me to realistically maintain that is very unhealthy. It's not achievable, maintainable, um, and it's not conducive to actual happiness. And we'll dive into that a little bit later. But the images that we're constantly seeing on social media are very misleading um, in a number of ways. One, they're often photoshopped to the max, or they're not even real people. With AI now, there are like fitfluencers or whatever you want to call them, that that's not even them. Like it's all AI generated, which is crazy. And if you see the person in person, like I would want people to be like, oh, you look like you do on social media. Yeah. Like I'm not going to change things and then go to an event or something. And then people be like, "Mm, you clearly Photoshop. Like, no, yet that's what a lot of people do, which is crazy. Um, and women portrayed in these images, if it is natural, so maybe it's bodybuilding shows and things like that, you have to realize that they have sacrificed their health in order to look that way through pretty unsustainable habits like extreme dieting, some pretty hardcore workouts, even the use of performance enhancing drugs. And unfortunately, these images have led us to believe that this is the like aesthetic gold standard and our constant exposure to these images perpetuates the belief that we need to strive for this quote unquote perfect look. Um, I think that this is like, this is a big thing for me. Um, like you'll notice, like I don't post pictures in bikinis and things like that. Like I don't want to use my body to try and sell something. And we don't do a ton of before and after pictures and stuff because like, even though that's something people want to work towards, that shouldn't be the be all end all. And it's not healthy. Um, and like what people have done to achieve certain things are not good. So Um, This is something I actually learned through one of my certifications. And you have to think about 
your health, your performance, and your aesthetic, kind of like a triangle. So you have this triangle, and at the top of the triangle, let's say one tip is aesthetics, one corner is going to be your performance. So maybe that's strength-based or marathon running or whatever that might be more performance-based. And then you have your health in the other corner. You cannot have one and have the other two. So if you want to be solely focused on aesthetics, so that would be like a bodybuilding type show, bikini show, your health is not going to be very great because that point you have to put like a dot within that triangle as to what you want. So you're going to make sacrifices in your performance, like whether that's activity wise and things like that, and your health. If we are focusing solely on performance, your aesthetics and your health are going to decrease. So if you look at like pro football players, for example, a lot of them actually don't look that fit if you see them at the beach and stuff like that, because they are focusing on their performance and that takes the priority. And just because you are a very good athlete does not mean you're going to look that great and your health might not be that good either because you're training really, really hard. So you kind of have to pick a point within that triangle as to what's kind of important. So if all three are really important to you, know that you're not going to have crazy, crazy, amazing aesthetics with a six pack. You're not going to be super, super crazy healthy, and you're not going to be super crazy, like performance based. So you really have to pick almost two and like pick which two are the most important to you and put that dot on the triangle to make it realistic. Um, because I think a lot of us think that someone who is very fit, very thin, um, very lean is also very healthy and also very good um, with performance in some in some areas. And that's not usually the case. If it is, that's very, very rare. Um, for the average person, you have to use that triangle. So kind of visualize that and that'll help you a bit. So I wanted to start off with some statistics here um, that are honestly quite shocking. Um, it breaks my heart a little bit. Um, if we have a daughter, we're finding out on Friday. I'm really hoping that I can sway her into the lower percentage of this. But according to a recent survey, 86% of American women reported that they are dissatisfied with their bodies and 40 to 60% of elementary school aged girls are concerned about their weight or becoming, lean, or becoming quote unquote too fat. That's crazy. 40 to 60% of elementary schooled aged girls are concerned about their body image and 86% of American and Canadian women are dissatisfied with their bodies. That is huge. That is huge. That means only 14% of us are okay with the way that we look, the way that we feel, feeling at home in our body and comfortable. That's insane. Why is this happening? Well, diet culture has con conditioned us to believe that our self-worth is inherently tied to how we look. And what's interesting is that even individuals with quote unquote ideal bodies report having body image issues. So this confirms that body image goes far beyond how we actually physically look. It's so much deeper than that. And body image is something that I've have struggled with in the past. Um, since I was like younger, I was, I was lucky that I had two grand grandparents or grandmothers who, um, were very different. So I had one that was always telling me I was too skinny. I was too thin. I needed to eat more. And then I had the other one that was always like, you look so good. You never change. I think you've lost some weight. You look great. So I had two very, very different grandmothers telling me different things. My mom though, like never commented on our bodies. I really can't think of a time that she would have ever said anything. Um, like she might be like, oh, like that shirt looks really cute on you or things like that. But it was never about our bodies specifically. Um, cause I really, I really can't think of anything. I think of my dad and he used to say horrific things. So I was the kind of girl that would wear leggings or sweatpants to school, baggy hoodie. Um, I was self-conscious about my body, even though I was one of the smaller people in my class. And my dad used to say things like, oh, like your boyfriend will leave you, like you're dressing like a slut because you're wearing leggings and things like that. And then I also had a high school teacher that told my mom, and she was very concerned, that I had to stop using my looks to get what I want. And I am someone who has worked 
incredibly hard. I studied really hard. I tried really hard in sports. Um, I, I never understood that statement and it actually really made me mad. And that was actually a driving fuel for me for a very long time to earn whatever it is that I achieve. And this is very important. I didn't want to be treated differently because I was a female or by the way that I looked, um, I would dress quite conservatively, um, especially when like teaching and in jobs and things like that, because I wanted to be respected. I never wanted someone to be like, oh, she's so cute or she's so pretty or, you know, I wanted to be good at what I did because I was good at what I did. Um, and if I got promoted or things like that, I didn't want it to have anything to do with the way that I looked. So I think I was lucky in that I had different voices telling me things at a young age that like really drove me to like want to quote unquote prove them wrong. And I think that helped a lot, but that's not the case for a lot of women, unfortunately. So like when we talk about body image, it really refers to how we perceive our bodies and the feelings that are associated with this perception. So everyone holds an idea in their mind of what their body looks like, right? Like people can be like, oh, you look really good. And to us, we're like, oh, I feel bloated. I think I'm overweight. I need to lose 10 pounds. So it's what you think of your body. And whether this idea is accurate is a completely other story, right? And our body image can be influenced by so many different factors and related to how we feel in the moment. So emotionally and physically. So like, you know, on my wedding day, I felt pretty great. I felt like a princess. I felt really beautiful. Um, whether or not we had a good or bad day, right? Like if we're having a rougher day, we might be more self-critical of ourselves and maybe not talk to ourselves in the best manner. Uh, maybe the number on the scale, you know, we talk about this all the time. You hop on the scale, it doesn't show what you think and or what you're hoping it'll show when you let it ruin your entire day. And then you're having all these negative self-talk. It can also be influenced by our hormonal imbalances because our hormones really dictate a lot when it comes to how we think and our emotions and bloating and all those kinds of things, right? Our patterns of self-talk is huge. And also the type of media that we consume. And of course, there's like a million other things you can add to this list. But poor body image can incredibly impact your self-esteem. I probably don't need to tell you that. Your mood, even the way that you act in social situations, right? Right. Body image is incredibly multidimensional. And in other words, it impacts your cognition, what we think and believe about our bodies and ourselves. Perception, so how we perceive the size and shape of our bodies. The emotions, so what we feel about our bodies. Behavior, the actions that we take to modify our bodies based on how we feel about them. So before we dive a little bit deeper into this stuff, we do need to address that body image is different from body dysmorphia. So body image is how your body perceives their appearance and the feelings associated with this perception. So how you really perceive that body dysmorphia is an actual health condition where the individual is consumed with thoughts about their perceived physical flaws, right? Um, often body dysmorphia is really all consuming and it can lead to some pretty harmful behaviors if left unaddressed. So for the purpose of today's talk, we're going to be addressing body image and the strategies you can employ to improve your own body image. Body dysmorphia is a whole other topic that we will uh, kind of tackle on another episode, but we really want to tackle how you perceive your appearance and the feelings that are associated with that. So first of all, our feelings can be incredibly deceptive. And I think that we all know that we can be really irrational sometimes. Like, I mean, we see the way that our like kids speak or our friends speak and we're like, okay, like roll our eyes a bit, right? You're being a little irrational, but our, our feelings can totally be deceptive. The way that we feel about ourselves and our bodies goes way beyond how we look, how we feel about ourselves is influenced by many, many, many factors. And it includes things like our history with trauma, our physical health, our mental health, our social and cultural influences, our hormonal balances. So for example, personal experiences like bullying, trauma, past negative comments about our appearance can contribute to a very poor body image. Positive experiences, on the other hand, can foster a more positive body image. So for myself, um, I was bullied a lot in school, um, like a lot. I hated high school. Um, my goal was to like get out of there with the best grades possible, like 
get whatever I could to really set me up for success further on because high school was a horrible place for me. Um, it was, yeah, I'm not even gonna like dive too deep into that, but the, so I had the teachers that were telling me one thing, right. That said I was using my looks to, to get what I wanted, which was insane. Um, and like wildly inappropriate. Like, I can't believe they thought that would be okay, but whatever. Um, but you know, like I had, um, like a girl in high school used to call me mosquito bites because my boobs are non-existent. Now they're coming in. I've been waiting since since I was 14 for these. Now that I'm pregnant, they're finally here. Um, but like, it took me a long time to get comfortable with my body and not be self-conscious because it was something that was like pointed out a lot. Um, I had like a university professor, we were doing, um, body composition things. So men typically have wider shoulders and narrower hips. Females are usually a little bit more hourglass shaped, like hips to shoulder ratio, like the width wise is pretty even mine are not. I have very wide shoulders and narrower hips. And my professor walked by and he was like, Oh, that's funny. You have portions like a male and walked away. I was 18 at this time. My self-confidence went to crap because I was like, oh my gosh, I look like a man. Like, I'm never going to be loved. I'm never going to be feminine. I'm just a super masculine tomboy. Um, Like all these things just started like rushing into my head because of what one person said. So positive experiences, on the other hand, can foster a more positive body image. So there was a man um, who, and I mean, I used to get so uncomfortable in the gym because people make comments about your body all the time, which is like super not okay. But I was doing bench press and then one of the regulars was there and I was pumped. I did 45 pounds on each side. That was like a goal I had been working towards in high or in university for a long time. And I was super excited afterwards. And he came out to me, he's like, you are so fit now. Like your body looks and like is so strong. I remember when you first started working out in here, like you have changed so much that you should be really proud of yourself. And that was a really good experience for me where someone like pointed out that I was strong. I was fit. I could do things. I can do hard things. Um, so that really helped me stay in the gym for a long time because it was like, I can achieve these things. I had different goals that I was working towards and not a lot of them were aesthetic at that point. At that point, I had gotten past some of the eating disorder type stuff that I was going through or disordered eating, I should say, um, and not healthy practices. And it was comments like that, that really made a big difference for me and helped me keep going and focusing on my health. Um, to this day, I don't think that man would like know that, that, that sentence, that interaction we had had such a good positive impact on me. Um, other things that can really affect things are, are chronic health conditions, disabilities, or changes in physical health that really influences how we perceive our body. So chronic pain, physical limitations that can also impact because it makes you feel less than, or, you know, when you feel quote unquote weak or sick, or, you know, you've lost something that you've had, that can be really hard and it can make you lose a lot of self-worth. Um, for me, I've lost a lot of strength in the last, the last year, I would say, um, because I haven't been as consistent with my workouts and then being pregnant is a whole other, other ball game. Right. And so it can, it can really change how you view your body because you're so focused on what you've lost that it's hard to get out of that negative thought pattern of I'm not there anymore. I've lost this. I used to be this. I used to be this. And you're so stuck in the past that it makes it really hard to move forward because you're so focused on what you don't have anymore. And I think we can all agree that's not very healthy. Then there are individuals with certain personality traits. So someone who is a perfectionist or has low self-esteem are probably going to be significantly more susceptible to developing some negative body image perceptions, right? So if you are so everything has to be right and very type A and everything has to be perfect, and if it's not perfect, it's the end of the world, it can make it very easy for us to be super critical of ourselves and be like, I'm not worthy enough and all those kinds of things when that's really not the case. And it can be really tough to get out of that mindset as well. Then we have different cultural and society's expectations, right? We have varying ideals of beauty. So cultural norms and societal expectations regarding body size, shape, and appearance 
can significantly impact how we perceive our own bodies. So, um, you know, like in Latin communities, women are usually a lot curvier. Um, and where, where the heck were we? Oh, it was when we were in Miami. And I remember thinking this, and I never told Taylor this, but we were walking. And I remember thinking, man, it is so nice to be around more Latin people because it makes me feel more quote unquote normal. Um, because like, I'm never going to be like a, I'm not a large person by any means, but like what the things that you see on social media is not, not what I will ever look like. Um, I'm a person that can put on fat mass and muscle mass pretty easily. Um, for me to get super lean is really hard and also not very healthy, but like, you know, we have, we have bigger butts, you know, like we, like even my sister and like people in my family, like bigger hips. I don't have the super big hips, but I do have a butt, but it's like, it was nice to see that like these people were clearly healthy. They were fit and curvier, which was like nice to see. Whereas like growing up, I grew up in a small farming town of a thousand people. Yes. My, my, my town is a thousand people. Um, and my graduating class was a big class. We had a class of 40. Um, but usually it was more like 20, right? My boyfriend in high school, he was in the neighboring town. His class had a graduating class of like 12 and that was big for them. So like it was a small, very like French, Ukrainian, like white community, to be honest. Um, there were some immigrants that would come from like Peru, but that was like pretty much it. Like we didn't, there wasn't a ton of like cultural differences and it wasn't until you were out of it and like traveling more or even like in the, t- the town that I lived in, the city that I lived in, it was still predominantly very much like a, a white community, which is fine. Like, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it was like, it wasn't until I traveled more that you like see things that are quote unquote different and normal. So it's, it's important to be aware that like what you think in terms of like our body shape, size, appearance, what's appropriate, what's not has a lot to do with like where we grew up and what we're exposed to. Um, and like, I felt like I had like a quote unquote normal upbringing, which like trauma aside and stuff, obviously, but like you don't realize what's quote unquote normal or the diversity that there is out there until you get to experience it and take yourself out of it. Um, which again, is just very, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it was an interesting moment for me because I didn't like realize it. And I mean, that just happened this year. So <laughs> like, uh, it took me a long time to get there. Um, and then also body image can change at different life stages, especially once we're in perimenopause and menopause, which is what we're going to really talk about. But these transitions and hormonal changes can bring about shifts in our bodies, percept- like the way we perceive our body, the way our body actually looks, how our body functions, how we feel, our emotions. So like, it's important to be aware that the hormonal changes that you're going through are going to impact how you feel about your body because things are changing and you can't always rely on how you're feeling because we know that hormones and so many other things are going to influence that. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're like quote unquote fat or you're not worthy or you're not making progress. I know that might make some people frustrated because you're like, yes, I am gaining weight. Yes, I am feeling fluffier. And we're going to talk a bit more about that here. But the more we focus on where we're not yet, you're not going to get to where you want to be by hating yourself. And it's okay to want to change where you are and not absolutely love what you look like right now that you want to change. You want to grow. You want to improve. You want to improve your health. There is nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't mean that you can't like who you are while you're trying to change, you don't have to wait till you achieve a certain thing to actually love yourself. Like, is that really the kind of messaging you want to pass on to like your siblings and your kids and your nieces, maybe your students, if you're a teacher, because you don't realize how much people can like pay attention to or what they pick up on, not just even if you're not saying certain things, the way that you act, um, the way that you like hold yourself, right? Like your body language. 
And I think that's like a really huge thing because like how do you think you would feel if someone that you loved and really cared about was talking to themselves that way? Like you would probably be so upset if that was like your daughter or your niece or your sister. Like it breaks your heart, right? So like why are you giving yourself less compassion than that that you give others? So, sorry, that's like a bit of a sidebar, but like, I think when you can really try to remove yourself a little bit and like put like, okay, what would I tell someone who was going through this? Like your best friend, your daughter, whoever that is, why is it different if it's you? It shouldn't be. Like you shouldn't love yourself less than you love someone else. That doesn't work. You're never going to be happy. Even if you achieve the physical goals that you have, like you need to learn how to remove yourself from that a little bit, which is, it's hard in the moment. I will give you that, like been there, done that sucks. But like, you know, I got past the little boobs thing. I did like, I got comfortable with it. Like, especially after seeing friends who had like breast reduction surgeries and they were so excited to be able to go buy like regular bikinis and bras and things like that. Like it makes you appreciate things a little bit more, but like removing yourself from that stuff is important. And again, it's hard, but like being able to go through some things I'll kind of talk about today on how to do that is going to be important for you. So you cannot always rely on how you feel. If you feel full, right, or bloated, it doesn't mean you've gained weight. It means there might be some gas, there might be some extra fiber, there might be some extra water, you might be constipated, right? Or you're just stressed out and you're getting some bloating. During phase one in our program, so if you're doing reverse dieting, this is what we do in phase one. If you're someone who is increasing your calorie intake slowly, it's expected that you will see like two to five, potentially seven pounds increase on the scale. And many of our clients feel super uncomfortable because they're not used to eating enough food. They're not used to having adequate fuel in their bodies and their preconceived ideas of what constitutes quote unquote enough calories really impacts how they feel about themselves. So for example, there's someone in our program right now. Um, I shouldn't say someone, there's a few people in our program right now that are just stuck at the certain calorie intake. And it's like 1700 calories. And like, we want to get them to 19 so we can fix everything and get down to where you need to be, go into a fat loss phase. And they just can't pass 1700 calories. And it's like, can you add a tablespoon of honey to your yogurt? And they'll say yes, which like we all know a tablespoon of honey is not going to fill you up. But then they'll like take things out. And it's, it's this number that they can't get past mentally because the fear of going over 1700 calories and that somehow that's just going to like shoot the weight through the roof And they just can't do it because they're going to be too full. A tablespoon of honey, a slice of cheese, six almonds. Those are all about like a hundred calories, right? That's not going to make you feel crazy, super full. But yet there's just some sort of mental block there where it's like, I can't do it. And if you're putting a limitation on yourself as to what you're able to achieve because of this one thing. And we'll ask like, what is it about this number that like scares you? And I'll just get, I don't know. It's just scary. Okay. Like what do you, what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. I'm just afraid. But if we can't figure out why, then we can't help you. So having the conversation is important, but also being aware that like you're imposing a limitation on yourself that's preventing you from being successful. No one else is posing that limitation on you. So where is that limitation coming from? Who said that? Where did it come from? What proof do you have? Or like, what memory do you have that that is like really preventing you from being successful? Right? Like why, why is that number? Like, why is that the hard stop for you? And it can be tough because again, this is like a, a preconceived like just knowing that they're going over 1700 calories, they feel uncomfortable, but it's not actual like physical. I'm full. It's a mental uncomfortable, not a physical uncomfortable. So what I really want you to do is like, don't become your worst enemy here. It's important to let go of those 
prior beliefs that, oh my gosh, those prior beliefs that you have about dieting and really changing your view and challenging it and being like, I'm eating so much to, I'm eating the right amount for my body to be healthy. And you might have to say that multiple times. And you might have to say that out loud to make it real. Because for me, for example, when I'm struggling through something, I could internal, I can internalize things pretty well. Um, but saying it out loud makes it real. And usually when I say it out loud, it comes with tears. <laughs> so, um, because it just, it's like speaking it into existence, which can be scary, but then the relief that you get from having that be out there and known and letting it go is so powerful. And like you feel empowered and in control again, which is amazing. Um, like it's, it's big. So like, I'm going to give you guys an example and I'm probably going to tear up because I'm already, already feeling it. But for myself, oh man, this is something about like speaking into existence that makes it real. And it's like hard. It doesn't have to do with body image, (laughs) but I just want to give you an example about like how powerful this stuff can be. So for me, I am so excited to have this baby, like so excited. And I just have this like, like doing it without my mom is very hard because you never think that that's, you know, I never imagined she wouldn't be here for this. And I just have this like fear, which is irrational. It might happen. It might not happen. But the fact that I'm crying right now probably means it'll probably happen, but that's okay. Um, but like I have this like you know, you see the pictures and like you hear the stories of like, oh, they put baby on my chest and it was the most beautiful, happy, amazing moment. And I know that's not true for lots of people because some of my friends have told me that they were like incredibly depressed and afraid and like nervous and all those things, right? It's the fear of the unknown that gets you, the unexpected, the uncertainty, right? And I know that comes with like increasing calories and all those things too. But I have this vision of like them putting baby on my chest and being like, so overwhelmed with like not just happiness but like the grief that comes from my mom not being there and I don't want it to just take away from that moment but like it's like Taylor and I talked about this at freaking Disney World <laughs> we were having lunch just came out but it's like I felt really good after like talking about it but it's still Like, will it happen? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But it's like, it's just you work yourself up as to what that moment is going to be. And it's no different when we talk about our our weight and increasing calories. We like, we work ourselves up to this moment of like, oh man, I'm going to increase my calories and I'm going to get fat. I'm going to do this and it's not going to work. I'm going to do this and then I can't do it. I'm going to try and do this and it's not going to work. And I'm going to commit to this and I'm not going to do it. Like we work ourselves up so much with like anticipation that like then manifests into like overwhelm and anxiety over something we don't even know what's going to happen. It's anticipation for the future of what we don't know yet. But that same circumstances are the ones that give us excitement. We're excited for the unknown, the what's next, the what's, what could happen, all the potential possibilities, right? And for me with baby, it's like, it's a mix of both. It's like a fear of like, this crippling grief that's going to hit me, but there's also so much excitement and joy. So it's okay to have both, but you can't let that stop you from like doing the things to get to where you want to be. So are you letting the unknown, the uncertainty, are you looking at that as like an opportunity and excitement and like, you know, looking forward to this moment in the future that you don't know when it's going to be there and what it's going to look like? Or are you letting that uncertainty and the unknown become this crippling anxiety and fear that stop you from doing the things and being miserable because it's the exact same situation. It's just that change in mindset and mindset is, is everything. It puts things into perspectives and it reminds you that you're doing what's what you're doing because it's best for your health and what you need. But we let that uncertainty and stuff just really cripple us from moving forward. And like knowing that you're your health is the most precious thing that we have. Don't downplay the importance of prioritizing your health before we achieve those physique goals. Like, I mean, I never thought my mom wouldn't be here for like kids, 
getting married, like, you know, all these, all these things you picture because her health was taken away from us. Right. So like, don't downplay how important this is, because if you're not healthy, what's the point? What's the point if you have to be a sideline parent or a sideline grandparent because you can't keep up with grandkids or you're too tired or you're sick all the time or, you know, like, don't you want to be present? Don't you want to do things? Don't you want to be there and create memories? Yes. And I know that's like a, Steph, I just want to lose 20 pounds. Yeah. But if you aren't fixing your internal health, you can end up with autoimmune conditions, hypothyroidism, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all these things that are stress induced from not eating enough food. We see it all the time. So there's people who have heart attacks who look fit all the time and it's stress induced. I know people who are super fit and super active and they're struggling with crazy gut health issues right now and they're struggling with losing muscle mass because of it. There's people who I know that got hospitalized because of overstressed, like, you know, so don't downplay how important that is. And I know it's hard because we're all so consumed with how we look like, and we're not where we were, we want to be yet. But would it matter if you were 20 pounds lighter and you were exhausted all the time and you felt like you couldn't eat food and you had no appetite, uh, you couldn't put on muscle mass, you couldn't participate in the things that you like, you're getting sick all the time, so you're missing out on stuff, maybe it impacts your ability to travel, is that what you want? No. So being able to remove yourself and like adjusting that mindset is important. And then the next part is how you talk to yourself matters so much. And I know that's something that people hear all the time and they roll their eyes, But the language that we use when we speak to ourselves matters not only at the emotional level, but the physiological level as well. So negative thought loops and negative self-talk are both associated with higher stress levels. Our brains is amazing. It's very finicky. They are biologically primed to believe what we tell them. Because if our brain thinks we see a bear, we're running. Okay? If our brain thinks that there is a tornado coming, we're looking for shelter. Like we go into fight or flight. But like nowadays, we see something, think something, perceive something, our brain still goes into fight or flight, regardless if you think you're handling it or not. So like the way that you talk to yourself is really important because if you tell your body that you are fat, your body is going to look for proof and provide you with proof that that is in fact true. So if we tell ourselves that we aren't looking good enough today, our brain is going to give us a highlight reel of all the reasons that yes, in fact, that is true. And it takes a long time to build up evidence for the positives compared to the negatives. Negatives, it doesn't take much for our body to be able to create that highlight reel because that's just the way our brains are wired. Um, That's a self-protective mechanism. So you need to actively put in more effort to point out the positives and the achievements and celebrate those wins so you can have that highlight reel of the positives to counter out the negatives. It takes a lot more positives to counteract one negative um, thought. Okay. Or one negative experience, one negative moment. Okay. So stop confirming what you don't want to be true. You are putting limitations and you are putting all of these labels on yourself. You're doing that. No one else is doing that. You're doing that. Maybe a doctor might say like, oh, your BMI, this and blah, blah, blah. Sure. But you don't have to reinforce that by constantly picking out everything that you don't like about yourself and that is wrong. So stop making yourself a negative highlight reel. Stop choosing that. And I know it's easier said than done, but what's the point? Is that helpful information? Is that doing anything for your mental health and your happiness? What's the point in doing that? There is none. So for example, let's say you hop on a scale and the scale's up a couple pounds because you're reverse dieting. And now you're using that as like a, oh, this happened because I have a lack of willpower around chips or this or that. You start giving yourself all these reasons, all these excuses as to why it's not working and why you suck as opposed to being like, hey, you know what? 
The scale is probably up because I'm eating a little bit more food. So there's more food in my digestive system. If I'm eating two more apples a day and then hopping on a scale and holding those two apples, obviously the scale is going to be heavier. But yet we, we create these narratives in our head that aren't even true. But the good news is, is that you can change how we talk to ourselves. We can change our mindsets. And we're going to get into some strategies at the end of this here. But like, really, like ask yourself, is this true? Would my friend say this is true? Would my parents say this is true? Would my coach say this is true? Because we can't always rely on how our thoughts and feelings manifest and the stories that we create about ourselves. Okay, so the next one is don't fall into the trap of the comparison game. This is, you know, everyone says comparison is the killer of joy, right? Thief of joy. And it's 100% true. If you compare yourselves to others, um, it's not only counterproductive, it can actually be incredibly harmful. Comparing ourselves to others can hurt our self-esteem. It can make us feel like we're not good enough. And it can actually increase our cortisol levels by increasing our body stress response, which we know by now cortisol is not a good thing to have chronically elevated all the time. And one of the most amazing things about life is that you are the only you when everyone's like, oh my gosh, Steph, this is so cheesy. Like, why are you talking about this? Because it's true. You are unique and your journey is not going to be the same as everybody else's. You never know where other people are in their journey. Everyone starts someone and you can be comparing your day one to someone's day 1000. Okay. And that's extremely misleading. And it leads us to set really unrealistic, realistic standards for ourselves. Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not going to do a complete 180 and change into a different person in a day or even a month change takes time. So it's important to focus on your individual journey and your progress. Look at pregnancy. For example, everyone's pregnancy story is completely different. I have been blessed with not being nauseous and puking, which is amazing. I'm super grateful for that. Cause I hate puking. I cry every time. Whereas my sister-in-law's both puking up to like 20 weeks, <laughs> not a good time, but it doesn't mean there's anything inherently wrong with them. Our journey and our body's physiology is just different. So like, you cannot compare things like look at surgical outcomes. Some people recover super quick from any surgery. Others takes forever or they may have to get a second one done. Everyone's journey is different. So like when something as like, I don't want to say small, the surgery is big, but like something more controlled, like a surgery, like let's say a knee replacement to have drastic outcomes, person to person, have like 30% of those not even improve your outcomes and your pain of course, your health and fitness journey is going to be different. There's more variables involved than there is in the surgery. But yet, for some reason, we think everyone should be the same, react the same, get the same results. And that's not how this works. And the journey to get there is going to be drastically different. So now that we know a little bit more about body image and the multitude of factors that go into it. Let's talk about what you actually care about, which is how do I improve my body image because I hate myself right now. And how do I let go of the fact that I don't feel that I'm good enough as I am right now? Because let's face it, that's a problem. We all have this issue. So strategies to help improve your body image. Here we go. Social media cleanup. If there are certain social media accounts that cause you to feel poorly about yourself, unfollow them. You do not need to subject yourself to media that makes you feel less than. Take inventory of your social media and if the accounts you follow don't spark joy or education or enhance your life, drop them. I actually had to follow um, some people in the field that I used to really respect, um, but there are certain posts or reels or whatever out there that make me feel like I'm losing a fighting like an uphill battle, that I'm losing the the hard work that I'm putting in to help women isn't paying off or it's almost being like, no, it's just calories in calories out, right? Like, no, there it's more complicated than that. It's not just how much you eat and how much you burn off. Like, I think that we're all living proof of this. Every woman who listens to this podcast is like, yeah, no, because like, otherwise, who would hire a trainer? Who would hire a coach? We wouldn't have all the issues that we have today, right? And I had to unfollow them because 
it would literally make me mad every single day that I was like, you are part of the problem. Like you are, you are part of the reason people feel so poorly about themselves. And like, they just feel like they're not doing well enough because you're basically calling them lazy. No, like, so to me, it was affecting how showing up in work. So I had to remove them. Um, I've removed people that like overly show off their bodies. Cause for me, I'm like, I don't want to see that. I don't think that's important. Um, I don't want when we have kids for them to be like comparing themselves to that or thinking that's how you're going to get famous. Right. Like you see people with all these followers that are, you know, super fit and showing off their body and they're in bikinis all the time and stuff like that. But I mean, we've worked with some of their clients or they've come to me and asked me for business advice or I've met them in person and they are not happy. And while that helps me help me feel better about myself, I had to remove those things from my social media because it was negatively impacting my day. And I didn't realize how much it was affecting me, like not just in that moment, but like it was something that I was like really focusing on throughout the entire day. I kept going back to that post or kept going back to that reel or looking at the comments and that was doing nothing for me. So I had to let it go and I had to unfollow and I feel so much better now. The next one is positive self-talk. Stop yourself when you are engaging in negative self-talk. Catch yourself because we don't realize how much we do it. I bet you if you took a notepad or wrote in your notes a little check mark for each time you caught yourself saying something negative about yourself, you would be shocked. You need to be able to first realize that this is a problem before you can address it. So when you catch yourself talking badly to yourself, check that, right? And stop that thought process and instead list three things that you love about yourself. So for instance, you can think about how strong you are, how great of a mother you are, what you've accomplished in your career, and that you are more than just a body, Um, which is again, a lot easier said than done. But like, if you can take inventory of when this is happening, um, what led up to that negative thought, right? So who were the people involved? What events were leading up to this? Where were you? Who were you with? Um, Like those things will make you aware if you're in an environment that is conducive to you being super critical of yourself. Like, I don't think we realize how much like things can lead up to this. So what happened that day that led you to like, think that thought? Um, Was it a post? Was it your boss? Was it stress? Was it the kind of food that you ate? Was it, you know, like the people that you were with it? Someone make a comment. Like, did someone talk about how they were losing all this weight on like Ozempic or Octavia or whatever it is? Like, what are the things that led up to that? Because if you become more aware of that, Then we can start addressing those causes and removing those triggers, which will make you feel so much better about yourself. I love this next one. Talk to yourself the way you would talk to your best friend or your daughter for that matter. Think about all of the people that you love. You would never say the things to bring them down or make them feel bad about themselves the way that you do to yourself. We love people because of how they make you feel not because of how they look. This is so important. People will not remember the things that you did or the amount of money you made or the way that you looked. They will remember how you made them feel. Think about people that you've lost, whether it be friends that have passed away, parents, um, even kids, you know, grandparents, any person that you have had the unfortunate experience of losing, you don't think about how they look like. You think about how they made you feel, the memories that you had together. Like those are the things that matter. Like for me, on our side of the family, big noses are are a part of our genetics. Um, We call it the Pachetto nose. Um, We we all have it. Some of us worse than others. Um, We can thank my grandfather for that. But I mean, that's not what I think about when I think of him. I think of him 
being active for as long as he could before he was stuck in a wheelchair and playing soccer with us or sneaking us chocolates and, and laughing with us and playing card games and the stories that he would tell us and the smiles he would give us and like how much love he gave us. I don't think about the way that he looks when I think about whenever I think about the way that he looks, I think about how he had his little like comb over here. He looked just like the, the grandfather from the movie up. If you know that movie looked just like him, I swear. I cry every time I watch that movie just because it reminds me of him so much. Um, but a lot less grumpy. He was a very happy guy and just like, he was so relaxed and he loved food and he loved laughing and spending time with each other. And you know, my grandma would get mad and he kind of just raised his eyebrows and be like, Oh, you did it. Like, you know, that's what I think about when I think about the way he looks. I think about what he looked like when he was with us and the clothes that he would wear. Like I still have some of his like polo sweaters and stuff. But then I think of, I think of how small he was at the end of his life because he was so sick. Like I don't think of his looks as a part of the reason why I loved him. I think about the teachers that I had that made a huge influence on my life. It had nothing to do with their looks. It had to do with the way that they made me feel and how much they cared and the extra mile that they went. Like, that's what matters. And I know it can be so hard because we're so focused on this, like, weight loss goal and all these things. But do you think when you're negatively talking to yourself all the time, you are showing up as that person for your your family? Do you want them to think of you as the person that was always trying to lose weight, always making comments about their body, always miserable, not wanting to be in photos, not wanting to go to events, not wanting to go out for family pizza night? Is that what you want them to remember? No. So it's important to adjust that. And there's nothing wrong with still wanting to improve your body, but you can't let that be the all consuming thing for you because I promise you people will remember that. And that's not what you want them to remember you by. The next one is self-affirmations. This is a hard one, but again, saying things out loud makes it real. I appreciate my body for all it does for me. At the end of the day, your body just wants to keep you alive. And it does so much for you that you aren't even aware of. Every single cell in your body has a specific goal has a specific job and what a miracle it is for you to be alive because a lot of people are not blessed to be on this earth long enough you are deserving of happiness i love this affirmation you are deserving of happiness and joy despite everything else that's going on including how you look finding things that bring you joy and actually doing them as often as you can is really important. Like I really struggled when I moved to our home to uh, Taylor's town at first because I lost volleyball. I lost a community that I was a really big part of. So then once I started getting back and doing that again and just putting myself out there and finding a team, that changed a lot of things for me. I got so much happier. Like do the things that actually fill up your cup. Do them. Whether that's reading, maybe you're trying a new hobby or picking up an old one, or maybe you're enjoying quiet afternoons in the park, going for a walk, crocheting, knitting, coloring, whatever that might be, but do the things that make you happy. Because if we're constantly focusing on just trying to lose weight and where we, where we aren't yet, like you're not just magically going to be happy once that scale changes. I promise you, you're going to feel like nothing changed. Not unless you do the internal work and focus on doing the things that actually make you happy and you are deserving of happiness. Oh, this is such a good one. I love this affirmation. Everyone should write this down somewhere. I am in control of my thoughts. You, you are the driver of your thoughts. You can choose whether to engage in the negative and let that spiral and let like yourself catastrophize or you can choose to... View the world through the lens of positivity and opportunity and curiosity. It's going to take work. It's going to, to take time, but it's 100% going to change your outlook for the better. So this is the whole like giving birth to a baby and being afraid of this grief stuff, right? Like anticipation for the uncertainty and the unknown in the future. It's a lot better and more enjoyable to approach that with curiosity and excitement 
um, viewing it as an opportunity as opposed to, you know, letting it turn into fear and anxiety and depression and just letting it almost like paralyze you. And then you're stuck in a place where you don't want to be. So every single opportunity that comes your way, every obstacle, it's just an opportunity for growth. That's all it is. So instead of looking at obstacles and hardships in that negative light, try to focus on the positive. What can I learn from this? Every obstacle provides an opportunity. It just requires a different perspective to see the silver lining and look at the obstacles as opportunities to learn and grow. Um, That's like the whole, you never lose. You either win or you learn. And I think that's a really great, powerful way to kind of look at it. But like, life is never perfect. It's not. Life is never going to go the way that you want. The journey is never going to look the way that you want it to. And I think that almost like debilitates us a bit because we have this expectation of what it's going to look like. And when it doesn't happen that way, we're like so upset. But I mean, imagine, I don't know, potty training your kid. Did that go how you planned? Probably not. Did your delivery go perfectly as planned? Probably not. Training a dog. That never goes as planned, right? Like we came home from a conference or uh, yeah, from Florida. And uh, I mean, our flights were delayed. That didn't go as planned. Came home. We were expecting to crawl into bed. Turns out Mosquito, our cat, when we're gone, she likes to pee and poop in our bed as a sign of being upset that we're gone, I guess. So then we're up later than we wanted to be. And like, you know what? You adjust and you learn and you move forward from it because that's all you can do. Because what is like, if you just keep ruminating and just focusing on the negative all the time, what is that doing for you? Realistically, like is anything positive coming out of that? Probably not. So let go and move on. That's it. Gratitude putting things into perspective and reminding yourself of how lucky you actually are to be able to move your body, to have a roof over your head, to have heat and food. Like many people on this earth are not that lucky. And I know people like hate this one too, but try to appreciate the little things in life, like the ability to take your dog for a walk, to make dinner with your loved ones, to do things with your children or grandchildren. We have so much to be thankful for in our lives. And it's easy to forget how lucky we are in the lives that we actually have appreciating diversity. Like I talked about with like going to Miami and being like, this is really nice to see this. Um, but I mean, we don't look at trees and go, oh my gosh, that tree is so ugly. We appreciate trees for how different they are, their diversity and natural beauty, regardless of how they look. Same with dogs, right? Like apply this concept to your body and to other bodies. Diversity is what makes this world beautiful. Can you imagine how boring it would be if everything looked the same? Every house, every tree, every animal, every person, boring. So next time you catch yourself thinking badly about your body, think about how special and unique you are, Um, which again, can be really tough, especially when we're going through a hard time, but it'll help in the long run. Self-compassion. This is a hard one to develop, but treat yourself with kindness and understanding. Give yourself credit for all you have accomplished what you can do as well in the future. So be excited for that. You are strong, you are resilient, and you are dedicated, and you should celebrate that. Surround yourself with positivity. Surround yourself with supportive and positive people who encourage self-acceptance, body positivity, and encourage you on your journey and aren't going to love you any more or any less based on how your body changes. Distance yourself from individuals who engage in body shaming or negative discussions about appearance. Um, This can be really eye-opening. Like, for me, it's like, oh, wow. Like, I wonder what you say about me behind my back, you know? Like, and it can be tough. And I've, in the last year and a half, I've removed a lot of people from my life, um, which is not easy. But, like, I have a solid group of people around me now that I love they love me. We're so supportive. We're always excited for each other. And that's huge. And I think a big part of that was like finding a good team. Um, Everyone is so amazing and so supportive and 
excited and have passions and want to be doing this to help people. And it's been such an incredible thing to see and be a part of. Um, and it makes, it makes a huge difference compared to going to a job where people didn't want to be there and people were negative and talking negative about each other and other people and judgmental. And it's just been like, yeah, there's like no words to explain what a difference it makes to surround yourself with the right group of people. Engaging in your self-care. This is one that's super easy to (laughs) disregard because we're always taking care of other people as women, right? We only get one body. We might as well take care of it as it is the only one that we get. So we have to do as best a job as we can. Prioritizing that self-care that makes you feel good about yourself. So that could be reading, writing, drawing, coloring, knitting, crocheting, going for a walk, doing deep breathing. Maybe it's yoga. Maybe it's stretching. Maybe it's just taking five to 10 minutes to take your feet up, up on the wall to help you relax um, or taking yourself out for a coffee date. When I was single, I used to take myself out on a date once a month. I go to a nice restaurant. I'd sit at the bar. I would treat myself to a great meal. I might chat with someone at the bar. I might work a little bit, but like it was a, it was just a, a time for me. And I don't think we do enough stuff for ourselves. Um, it's always this hustle culture and like we feel guilty for taking time to, for ourselves. But don't you think that you would show up better as a, a parent, a partner, spouse, grandparent, coworker, friend, if you did take some time to fill up your cup? Probably. But yet yeah, we have such a hard time doing that. Um, visualization. This is a big one. So visualize the type of person you want to be. Do you want to be a light in other people's lives? Do you want to make a positive impact? Think about who you are and who you want to be and ask the questions like, what would fit me do? What would generous me do? What would healthy, strong me do? Visualize yourself as that person and fake it till you make it. Do the things that person would do. So for me, I am very much a person, and I say this all the time, people are like, what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered as the person who gave a crap. A person who listened, who took time out of their day to not disregard your feelings, to make sure that you feel validated, to help you feel some hope, to feel understood, to feel like I gave you my time to help make your life better. That is what I want to be known for. So on days where I'm really exhausted, I've been working a lot and I see my messages nice and full. You know, sometimes I don't have the energy to, but I always try to get to at least a few every single day. And this is why I get behind because life gets crazy. But because a person who was having a mission to help women in perimenopause and menopause and onwards, to help women understand how their body functions, to help women not feel alone, to feel heard, to feel validated, to feel, you know, to give them something so that they finally feel in control again, so that there is hope. Instead of just telling people you need to eat less, move more. Someone who acknowledges all the trials and tribulations that they have been through, that acknowledges how hard they have been working and what they've been struggling with and the severity of like what they've been through and how it's affected their body and their ability to show up and why they are where they are right now. And it's not not that they're broken. It's that we just need to fix some things. We need to adjust things and help you heal I want to be that person and a person who does those things messages people, creates content for them, makes a podcast talking about these things, hops on consultation calls, goes to events, like we'll talk to people when they come up to them in the airport. This has happened to me now, which is really cool. Someone just came up to me in the airport like, hey, you're that girl from Facebook. Like, thank you for what you do. And that's amazing. Like I'll have those conversations with those people. So if you ever see me, please come and approach me. Even if I look tired, this kind of stuff fills up my cup. But like, you need to start showing up as that person. Like, you want to be a great parent who shows up for your kids? What do you need to do so that you can show up for your kids? You want to be the person that gets a promotion at work? Okay, you start doing the things that would make sense for you to get a promotion, right? If you want to be healthy, fit, strong, what does that person do? You start doing it. And eventually, that just becomes who you are. 
And that's really exciting. And yes, it can be scary. And yes, you want to be at a point where you're not yet. But you have to learn to love yourself. You are not just your body. You are so, so much more than that. And you are likely the most important person in somebody else's life. And guess what? They don't love you for your body. They love you for who you are, how you are, how you make them feel. You give them all this love and attention and support. So let's stop falling for these stupid marketing crap gimmicks that tell us that our self-worth is based on what our body looks like because it is not. And that is what this industry has cultivated. And it's super frustrating because like, yes, you want to lose weight. Awesome. But you know what? We have to be healthy first before we can even get there. And even if you don't get to like, this certain pound number that you want. That doesn't mean you can't look great, feel great, have great relationships, have a great career, be happy, do the things that you've always wanted to do. And I think there's just such a huge gap between if I get here, I'll be happier and you won't. And I think that's a really tough pill to swallow. So working on these things will take time. And what you do now will be passed on to other people, whether it's coworkers, your siblings, family members, your kids, your nieces, your grandkids. So let's try and change that statistic. How can we make sure that there is more than just 14% of women in North America who are okay with their bodies? How can we make sure that 40 to 60% of girls in elementary school are are not worried about their body image and quote unquote getting fat. Like it's consuming them. So how can what you do change and impact those around you? Because you don't realize how one thing can multiply and grow. Like I talk to women and they're like, well, I avoid carbs as a mom did. I did this diet and this diet and this diet because my mom did. Like all those things get passed down. And even when they didn't talk about it or they tried to hide things from us, we were aware of it. So having those conversations and the way you talk to each other and the way you talk to yourself and the way that you act and show up and your own confidence and the way you live your life, are you going to be part of the reason that 40 to 60% of women, 40, 60% of elementary school girls are, are worried about their body image and gaining weight? Are you going to contribute to that 86% of women who are dissatisfied with their body and prevents them from attending things and living life? Or are we going to start changing things? And I know it's not easy. It's very hard to do. But being aware it's even happening first and understanding where your true value comes from is step number one. So go back through this episode. Go through some of the tactics that I talked about, like fear of the future. It's the same as excitement. It's the same situation. So are you viewing it as an opportunity and being excited about it? Or are you letting uncertainty and fear cripple you? Are you paying attention to how often you have negative self-talk? Are you comparing yourself? Like maybe you do have to do a social media cleanup, focus on positive self-talk, talk to yourself the way you would to a friend create some self-affirming affirmations and put those up places, practice some gratitude, appreciate diversity and self-compassion, surround yourself with positivity, engage in self-care and visualize who do you want to be and start showing up as that person. So I know this was a bit um, less sciencey than usual, but this is a very big thing that I am passionate about because we shouldn't be miserable in our bodies. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully there is a couple strategies in there that can, can help, but let's change those statistics. I would love to see those percentages change and it all starts with you. It starts with one person. So again, if anything, if you need anything at all, just message me, I'll calculate your calories. I'm quite behind on messaging right now. Um, there's a lot of you that have been reaching out, which is amazing. And I love it so, 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 so much. But the best way to get a plan, get your calories calculated and like know that you'll get it done like soon 
book a free consultation call because you know at the end of that call, you will know exactly why things aren't working, what steps need to move forward, um, and what that journey looks like and answer, ask all the questions that you have. And at the end of that call, you will have everything that you need. So if you want to do that, they're free. We don't even talk about coaching if you don't want to. This is just to help you start changing so we can change these statistics. Have a great rest of your day, you guys. Bye.